Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. Our podcast today is from a visit in June of 2017 with Dr. Tom Whiting of Whiting Farms, located in Delta, Colorado. Just a quick note, June in eastern Colorado is not the world's most temperate time to visit. Tom sets up shop there for many reasons, I'm sure, but the dry weather and remoteness are two big reasons it's a great place for a large-scale chicken operation. Disease is a big problem in the poultry industry, and arid conditions and a remote location make life much easier if you're a poultry producer. You'll hear about Dr. Whiting's education and background in the beginning of the podcast from the man himself, but he is a very low-key guy. He comes across with a very mellow demeanor, and you might never guess what's ticking in the massive computer that is his brain. He not only has the formal education, but he's one of the people that seems to have a sixth sense of what to do. In poultry genetics, the structured science part is hugely important, but I believe that Dr. Whiting just plain senses what to do with a line to make the genetics do what he wants. He's kind of like a pastry chef tossing in ingredients here and there to make new creations. At the time we interviewed Dr. Whiting, he had over 100,000 chickens. It's no small operation. He supplies feathers for fly fishing, crafts, and the fashion industry, and many other areas, and about three quarters of his feather market is abroad. He sells them in their natural state, dyed, clumped, packaged, individually, and just about every way you could possibly imagine. Whiting Farms supplies about 80% of the total world fly fishing market. Just think of that. If you know someone who is a fly fisherman, he probably has a whiting feather in his tackle box. Dr. Whiting's big claim to fame is the feathers he produces for tying flies, and specifically the whiting hackle. The hackle is the cape-type thing in the neck or saddle area of a rooster, and it's usually composed of longer feathers that might be four or five inches long. Through intense genetic selection, Tom has developed a hackle that's almost four or five times as long as others on the market, so the fly tires can get many more flies out of it. If you visit our podcast picture or do a quick web search on the whiting hackle, you'll see that the feathers look like a mad mating between a zebra and the medusa. I'm sure this man has many more breeding ideas than he has time to accomplish them. If you wanted a Dr. Seuss-like bird and gave Tom Whiting 10 years, he could probably create it. In addition to creating the whiting hackle, he's also created a high-production egg-laying chicken, almost 300 eggs a year that has a beautiful blue egg. He calls it the whiting blue. I have to say it's definitely producing one of the prettiest soft blue eggs I've ever seen. Okay, let me stop to say that I have eight chickens at home. They live in a nine foot by 15 foot redwood coop with elevated dust bathing tubs. They're pampered, probably a little chunky, and they peck me on the leg if they want me to sit down so they can sit on my lap. It's largely unimportant if they lay eggs. When my chickens pass on to the great beyond, from natural causes, of course, they have a nice little burial in the front yard with a rock pile on top. In other words, they're pets. So Dr. Whiting's operation took some adjusting for me. The barns are very clean and well ventilated, which is a big necessity for chickens and their sensitive respiratory systems. And the hens producing fertile eggs in the laying barns had eggs popping into the chutes at a good clip, which usually means they're very healthy. Though they were in smaller cages, the plumage on the roosters was very full and colorful and bright. But there was no mistake about the fact that Tom Whiting's chickens are bred for production. That's their job and their purpose. They're not pets, and many of them aren't bred for eggs or meat. The nearly exclusive purpose of most of Dr. Whiting's production is to produce feathers or to improve their breed. 
you either make it or you don't. So this is the part where I have to remind myself of purpose and the need for all animals to have one, so we have a reason to keep them around. I asked a person in the know about Tom Whiting before we went to interview him. One of the first things they said was, Tom has probably done more to preserve heritage breeds than most people you'll meet. And that's a pretty broad statement. Once we saw Tom's operation, we understood that a little better. Because he's so good at the management of breeding lines and is willing to use his skills in that direction, he's been a great boon to heritage breeds. He keeps some breeds at his facility just to make sure that they don't die out. He calls them library stock. And he maintains the generations for many of these animals just because he believes it's important that they don't die out. In the podcast, we mention the ancient breed of chicken known as the dorking. Go ahead and make jokes in your head now. But in case you don't know what a dorking chicken is, here's the skinny. This breed is named for a town in southern England and is one of the oldest breeds of chicken in Britain. They don't know for sure, but some say that the beginning of this line was actually brought to Britain by the Romans in 43 AD. It has five toes, which doesn't sound weird to people, but is extremely weird if you're a chicken, and usually have four. It's the only breed with a red earlobe to lay a white egg, and yes, that's actually a real thing. It's well known to be on the top of the gourmet list as one of the best tasting meat chickens ever. But the Dorking breed is a perfect example of what can happen to any breed of animal if focused attention is not paid to maintaining it. This ancient breed of chicken that's been around since the Redwoods were saplings almost went extinct in the mid-1900s. It's made a bit of recovery, but due to the low numbers and breeding pollution occurred, and now the Dorking people are struggling to get the breed back to the standard that should be expected. Some of the current examples don't have the five toes anymore, and the shape is sometimes like the breeds that they've been commingled with, and there's sometimes there's genetic problems. Tom Whiting has this breed, and others, in his library stock area, and is making an effort to work his magic to bring it back to what it should be. We hope you enjoy our podcast with Dr. Tom Whiting of Whiting Farms. Yeah, this is a line that's segregating into all the colors. And I haven't decided what color I want, so I'm just letting them be whatever color they want to be. So I keep the gene pool, all the colors in the gene pool. Looks like you've got a little bit of a different Yep, you're observant. And there's something else that's fundamentally different about him, and I'll see if you can see it. So, if we could start off with you uh, stating your name and your title and your farm's name. My name is Thomas Whiting. I'm uh, president, owner, and founder of Whiting Farms in Delta, Colorado. And could you tell me a little bit about uh, the region where your farm's located? Well, we're located in western Colorado, which is rather an arid, dry mountain valley in this area. In fact, Delta County is the driest county of all of Colorado. We're surrounded by the Uncompahgre mountain range to the due west, uh, the West Elks to the east, and the Grand Mesa to the north, and the San Juans to the south. So that's one of the reasons we're so dry is all those mountain ranges around us. Um, so how does the climate in this area impact how you raise your animals? Well, the climate, which is during the summer very hot and dry, and during the winter is cold and dry, is a fairly good and favorable environment for chickens in that uh, you can re it's easier to not have humidity because of the moisture, the, the litter dries out better. But also during the summer when it is hot, you can evaporatively cool. So it's advantageous to be in a dry climate. Interesting. So how did you hear about heritage breeds? I've known about heritage breeds since I was probably 10 years old when I started raising different breeds of chickens and I studied the catalogs like Murray McMurray and anything I could get my hands on. So those were the breeds that were uh, told me about. And uh, so I studied them and, and uh, learned about them, their traits and some of their histories. So you have quite a bit of experience in this. If you could outline your educational background with regard to uh, chickens and everything actually. Well, my chicken education started when I was about 10 years old when for reasons I, I'm not even sure why, I latched on to wanting to raise animals. 
and or I was just generally interested in all animals but chickens you could raise and they had a little product like eggs and I didn't do meat in those days but I did eggs and I was very interested in upland game bird as well like quail and pheasants so I just started no one in my family was remotely uh, interested in this it was my own interest I don't know why I really set out on it uh, I was sort of an agrarian throwback in the, the family tree I think but um, I just started getting baby chicks and peddling eggs around the neighborhood, showed poultry one year at a trade show, and then worked out at a game bird farm. So that was my basis of information, but I studied a lot of it. And then uh, when I decided to go into higher education, when I graduated from high school, and I had chickens uh, through about the time I was in high school, um, I actually studied other things like political science and literature and I don't know, I kept thinking about chicken and quail. So somebody made the grand suggestion, well, maybe you could study that. And no one had ever suggested that before. So I literally uh, explored different universities, bought myself a Greyhound month pass, and just traveled around the East Coast on my own when I was all of 19 years old. I visited Cornell and Maryland and some other places, and CSU. And so I changed majors into poultry science, having not known that I could do that. And uh, sort of, I've never looked back since then. So I got a bachelor's degree from the university, or Colorado State University in Fort Collins in 1980 in avian science, which is chicken science. Then I got a master's degree from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia in 82, specializing in poultry genetics and husbandry. And then I worked for a commercial egg operation for a number of years, managing production and all those things. And I still wanted to do something on my own. So I quit that job which took a lot of courage, I guess, and went back to the University of Arkansas and got my doctorate in poultry science. During that time, I looked into other things I'd like to do. My career goals was poultry genetics. I always found that to be, to be the most interesting subject, and my uh, prospects were I'd work for a primary breeder or a poultry genetics company, and I interned for two of them, so I had some experience there. But I really wanted to do something on my own, and about that time uh, a movie came out called A River Runs Through It, which had spurred a new interest or a, a bigger interest in fly fishing, and there was a shortage of hackle. And through just a funny pinball trajectory of contacts, I found out about hackle. And I studied it, and while I was in graduate school, I made contacts with some hackle producers, and most of them wanted to sell out. And so while doing my doctorate, I even did a business plan with the idea of starting Whiting Farms when I got out, which was, uh, I've got that business plan somewhere, but I don't think I'd have the courage to look at it at this time. But uh, I had another business idea as well, so I th thought, well, maybe I'll do this hackle business to fund my other business idea. So when I literally finished my uh, PhD in December of 88, I incorporated at Whiting Farms and started and I had a little savings and was able to pre-sell product before I'd produced a darn bird because there was such an intense demand for hackle because of the upshot of the yuppies wanting to go out and fly fish. And so my sense of timing was uh, the greatest gift I had apparently because uh, I made use of an opportunity and uh, that's 28 years ago. So oftentimes in life there was a large difference between theory and practice. Mm. And did you find that there was a gap between your education and what you learned about avian science there and a large-scale poultry operation? Well, I wouldn't have been able to do any of the businesses without that foundation knowledge with an undergraduate and a master's degree in poultry science because that's foundation information you need to incorporate so you can make decisions on a production point of view or you understand the industry you're going into. I did a lot of courses on genetics, both from plant science, genetics, and molecular genetics, and things like that. Uh, had I, and I worked for some of the primary breeders and knew how they had sort of set up industrial genetic programs. So I went in with a lot of foundation information. But what I found in the hackle business is there was very little written about it, nearly nothing. And there's not a lot of interest in feather characteristics. There's no economic basis to them, really. So I was able to, just through experience, learn the traits, whether they're highly heritable or lowly heritable or medium heritable, just by the effect of my selection efforts. So I had to kind of, utilizing all this fundamental information, make up my own program. And that was part of the fun of the whole thing. 
and um, uh, that's what I've sort of excelled at in what I've done. Um, institutional knowledge, I think, would be huge in your field in mm -hmm. terms of learning from the past and learning patterns, aside from a, a very deep uh, educational background. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the small things that might differ in terms of learning at the university and then maybe some things that came through a little differently than you expected when you started breeding chickens? Uh, many, many things have been different than I expected or no one would have had an inkling to research them prior to my involvement in the whole thing. Uh, many people think that the color genetics of the hackle birds is one of the toughest things, but actually it's quite simple. There's about six basic genes that you deal with, and that takes care of 90% of the colors that you're going to need in, um, in the production of them. Uh, the really difficult thing is the balance of traits when you're selecting birds for feathers for tying a specific thing, a fishing fly. There's no written information about this. It's experimental. And I talked to, or people were very willing to share their opinions about the proper feather. And I would listen to them and they'd demonstrate it to them. And I took a fly tying course one time. And, but a lot of people really care about their feathers in the fly tying world. And so I was at no loss of having people giving me their information about what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. So, so it was. In fact, we delivered, developed later on what we called a pro team, which were named tires that write books and articles and do demonstration. And they were part of the Whiting Farms pro team. And so we'd give them samples of feathers and I'd have them critique them and tell me what, what I needed to do or undo and what that kind of, and they guided me a lot of the ways. But basically, my knowledge came from handling every bird at hatch, putting together every breeder here, seeing the results of it, what worked and what didn't work, and seeing where they came from, where they are now, and where I wanted to take them. And that's a long-term perspective that only when you've done it for 10, 15, 20 years can you really grasp and understand and I worry about how I'm going to relay this to somebody else who's going to take over after me who hasn't started from 5,000 birds a year and getting to 100,000 birds. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> now, you did something similar with the gentleman that originally started your foundation line. Is that correct? One of the more interesting things about hackle production is how we can change the morphology or the form of the feathers in just a few generations relative to how long species have been around. My oldest pelts I can na name down for where they actually came from. This is a a, a medium gray or medium dun pelt from a man named Harry Darby who was a Catskill fly tire and early pioneer in hackle production. And I got this from a fly tying guy, a writer who was a friend of his. But you can see the feathers are quite short, the barbs are very long, and Harry Darby couldn't find the mayfly colors which he was tying mayflies for the fishermen there coming up for the Catskills to fish. So he got his own birds and he started playing around with it. So Andy, uh, Harry Darby was very generous and he gave birds to m numerous people. In fact, he gave them to a man named Andy Miner, whom I have his portrait up here. His son gave that to me. And he was an attorney by trade, but he actually um, really what he loved, his wife was also an attorney, which was unusual at the time in the 50s and 60s. But uh, she was really the bread earner and he liked messing around with his hackle chickens. And he was sort of the Johnny Appleseeds of the hackle world in that he never sold a pelt, he never sold a bird or an egg, he gave it to anyone for just the love of doing it and the interest in promoting fly fishing. And he was up in Minnesota in Duluth. Anyway, Andy Miner uh, was so down, most of the genetic stocks of the world in the United States came from his stock, with the exception of the Henry Hoffman stock, who had done, he found it at a county fair actually. But anyway, the best birds went to, of Andy Miners went to a guy named Ted Hebert, who was in the business for about 20 years, and he decided to get out, and I bought that stock from him. So going from here, Harry Darby, to Andy Miner, to, to Ted Hebert, to this, I'm sort of the fourth custodian of this line that goes back that long, and it chase, goes back to somewhere in the 30s and its origins were rather vague and not very well described. But it just shows the genetic plasticity of the chicken in regard to feathers. And really the result of this is the, I've been able to, in my large numbers that I produce, exert an enormously great 
selection pressure, and that's how you advance lines. So I use the top ten, one tenth of one percent of the males when I'm in my production males to be the sires for the next generation. And when you do that, you can make some rather radical material changes rather quickly. So these are sort of related to each other, but uh, quite a gamut to where they go. So would you say that there was an evolution in these, and yet the greatest leap, the, the change that you would notice physically, was when you were custodian? Yes, far and away. And in fact, the birds will not grow these feathers if given the opportunity. These are genetic extremes, and so you have to exert at least a 10 or 20 percent selection pressure just to keep them sta uh, static. Because these, they don't want to grow feathers like this. It's metabolically taxing. They're kind of in the way. They want to go to a norm, a sort of a homeostasis norm. So not only when you get them developed like this, you still have to maintain them with genetic selection and selection pressure. So that's the type of thing that knowledge transfer is super important. Right. And I wouldn't have been able to tell you when I started that this was even possible. It just happened as it happened. And I ground through, you know, millions of birds looking for these individuals. And when you do that, you, you make some progress. So I'd like to go back to one thing. And looking at you holding that, that's a very different size and shape than the, than the previous. Mm -hmm. And you're not a fisherman, you said. No, I'm not. And I, uh, um, but I think there's an advantage to that. I'm not just not being insecure and trying to rationalize or defend why I'm not a fisherman. I, I enjoy it, actually. It's an excuse to get out in nature and play in the water and things like that. But the fact that I'm not a fisherman or a fly tire makes me more objective. So I listen to my customers, the people that are really interested and really care about these things, and they keep me on the straight and narrow. And if I do anything wrong, they have no hesitation to let me know. So I, I would, one of the reasons I've advanced is people have taken great care in making sure I was well educated. So is is I, I understand that there's a little bit of a of an ownership that people have about their fly tying. Is that correct? Yes. So is it once once you're a Ford guy, you're always a Ford guy. Once you're a Chevy guy, you're always a Chevy guy. Well, if you're talking about the Hackle brands, no. When I got into the business, it was mostly controlled by a brand of Hackle called Metz, which was one of the branches of the Andy Miner stock by a guy in Belleville, Pennsylvania named Buck Metz. And when I got into the market, he had 70, 80 percent of the world market there. And so I, was, I bought the Hoffman stock, which was a small mom and pop operation. And with about five years, it was evidence I was going to maybe do something with it. And he sold out in about 95, about five years after I got into it. And that company, that Met stock, has been sold four or five times to different owners. But they're still in production. I don't know what portion of the market they have, but I think they're a distant, very distant third. What does that mean when you said you, you bought the stock? Does that mean it's, the, it's a non-compete, or how, do, how does that work? Well, you literally have a legal document prepared by attorneys, and I'm buying exclusive rights to the stock, and they agree to turn it over to me and destroy or any of the remaining genetic material they may have, eggs, birds, semen, whatever they have, and that I buy the name, the rights to the name, and, and that. It's a standard procedure to buy something. It's just like buying breeding cattle or something like that. But in this case, there's not many of the stocks available. And uh, so I own the best. Do you, do you find yourself wanting to either be politically involved to say, look, this is a business and I'd like to help preserve that? Or is there is there any way that you you feel like it's important to say, even though this is an animal that anybody can breed, this is something that I own the rights to, and I've worked long and hard to get this. How do you, how do you even preserve that? Well, I, that, I thought deeply about this when I was getting into it, and the other people that had developed these stocks, at least uh, uh, Henry Hoffman in particular, were certifiably paranoid. They had gates and guard dogs and everything else because they didn't want anyone else getting this. And um, in my early days, I was more of that bent, but now that I've gotten into it and I realize there's so much more, you have to have the production systems and personnel and facilities just to realize the potential in these birds, let alone then how to process them and dye them and everything. 
I now know there's a little bit more to it. So somebody even had a good bird, whether or not they'd ever get it off the ground and do anything with it. But I'm very interested in about genetic preservation because I would hate all these, my work and the people that came before me's work to be lost due to a disease problem or an environmental problem. And we've thought, I've done research and gone to symposium and things about genetic pre uh, preservation of different avian species and whatnot. The problem with freezing avian semen, which is one way you preserve uh, genetic material, is avian semen doesn't freeze well, or the survival isn't very good when you thaw it out. Unlike a mammalian, you know, all the dairy industry and the pig industry and all those other ones are highly dependent on it because it's much more effective. But there's been some new technology that has come around where they freed the gonads in liquid nitrogen of both males and females and preserve it. It was a lady, Chinese lady researcher in one of the Canadian universities that really came up with the initial techniques for it. And it almost sounds too good to be true, but you harvest the gonads, either the ovaries or the testes of the baby chicks, and you, with a very specific procedure to cool them down at a rate in a certain solution, you can actually freeze those. And the great thing about them is you can pull them out, thaw them, put them into a surrogate chick, and that chick's not going to look anything like the, the gonads you put into it, but they'll possess that genetic material. So you, and it, it almost sounds too good to be true, and we're hoping to get going with Phil Purdy and some of the other people. It's a proven method apparently now, and other genetic companies are using it because it's more economical to study, uh, to preserve lines in a doer of liquid nitrogen than it is on the hoof in a big old barn and all the expenses. Also, there's, it's a snapshot in time, so there's no genetic drift, there's no evolution, there's some other aspects of it too, both good and bad. But that's something on my agenda for the next few years because uh, I'm going to make use of this new technology. So uh, the thing I want to go back to with the, the fishermen, you have to work carefully in conjunction with them then because it's not, it, when you take something like that, how many flies, does, it, does one fly come from that? Do 50? Mm -hmm. In the early days, they were lucky to get one fishing fly per feather, or they'd have to use several. Now on these, they can get about 10 different flies per feather. So economically, this pelt represents probably 50 of any one of these younger ones. And the saddles, it's even more dramatic because they never quit growing. And you have these long things, and a good fly tire could probably do 15 to 20 flies per feather here. And there's 200 feathers on that. I count feathers on the darn breeders when I'm selecting them. So it's, you know, in the thousands of flies per unit. So on a sh I think my birds right now are somewhere in the order of five to six times as many usable feathers per rooster that my competitors have right now. Just because of the density of the feathers, the barb density, which is the little things that come off the rachis or the quill. And the, the, my other goal, if you look on this one, one of the easy ones, the, the trout flies are usually size, hook size, 14s and 16s. So there's only a little section in here that's 14s and 16s. And these ones are so short they're not even usable. And then these ones are just kind of wet fly feathers. When you take uh, one of my modern capes now, I push the sizes, the 14s and 16s, which would have been right there, I push them down in the broader part of the neck where there's many more feathers. So this is more of a, and my whole, and then that made these feathers even smaller but usable. And my, whole, my goal is to make the cape basically dry fly all the way to the bottom of the pelt. And on the bird, all the way from its beak to its tail is all dry fly. And I'm even seeing it spontaneously happen that these long feathers that are dry fly hackle are now starting to appear in other feather tracks around the body of the bird. I have roosters out there that are growing dry fly hackle across the tops of their uh, wings and then growing out of their thighs. So the, this intense concentration of the genes that make for dry fly hackle are now starting to invade other feather tracks on the body. So if you're a reductionist about it, you can just say this is just an extrusion organism for dry fly hackle and I'm putting more and more dry fly on that bird. And the ones that are really on this sort of uh, leading edge of development, I'm letting it happen on its own. I'm not breeding for it, I'm just watching it happen. And I'm gonna see if I can incorporate it. But it's something that I would have never predicted or even believed if it wasn't in front of me. Now, I used to say it was an art as much as a science. Yeah, I agree with that. Do you think that this is as much art as science, as even with the science, even with the genetics of it? Yes, I agree with that. And 
you have to, you know, any person that cultivates a single species or breed or an animal or something, they get to know it very intimately. And you gain a sense of what the, uh, the art of it is, what that animal needs to advance it, you know, how to balance it and whatnot. I think there's a lot to it. Somebody says I'm an artist and my media is chicken feathers. I always thought that was a little extreme. But, uh, you know, it, it is sort of, and some of them I can make different colors and, and uh, mutations happen and I put together new combinations of it. Like that's a pretty pelt right there. And, and you can control the mechanisms, the genetic mechanisms in here. This is just heterozygous for sex link barring gene. And when it hits this kind of color combination, these feathers actually shift. They're barred for a while, then they go to a brown, then they go back to barred. It so shows that they're unstable. And if you subscribe to the light switch theory of a gene control, <laughs> which is probably beyond the scope of here, but, um, but then look at that. So um, you also sell chicks. Can you tell us about that? Well, why I'm in this business is I like poultry and I like genetics and I like breeding programs. And what got me started was this feather, fly tying feather uh, goal and marketing idea and business. And I, I did that. But I like other things in poultry genetics as well. And I managed a commercial egg operation, so I knew quite a bit about egg production. And a, fr and, uh, a friend of mine named Dave Caveney uh, had bred a high production blue egg line. And he's, and when my daughters were young, he sent me some eggs to say, hatch these out. And so I just kept them in a little outbuilding behind our house for them to take care of the eggs and give them the table scraps. And they weren't very much interested into it, but I go, Dave, these are fantastic. I mean, they're just great layers and I love them. They're just really balanced. He goes, it's good. I'm going to send them to him. You'll do something with them. So he took the program and sent it to me. And what he had done is he'd taken blue egg, the O-gene that creates blue eggs, and he'd crossed it with commercial white leghorns, which are good egg producers, and got out the dominant white to get the colors back. And he had done that twice. So they're about 75% white leghorn, 25% O-gene Americana. And so I've done that one more time or two more times and really worked on all the traits for blue eggs and the colors and everything. And they're just high production blue egg layers. So I've, that was the gen genesis of my commer commercial ideas. And I'd made a green egg out of that too as well. And then I bred a big fibromelanotic meat chicken rooster, which I sold to a company called Tyson. And so I just kept doing it. And there was a little market locally and I'd, the word got out and I never advertised. I was always selling out the chicks. And last year in 2016, I think we sold 87,000 chicks with no art, uh, uh, with no advertising and not mailing any. And now it's gotten to a point where I'm selling a lot of breeders and I put together packages so they can be feather sexable or color sexable and I have male lines and female lines and they become quite popular. So I think there's a real niche for that. And it's a way of getting out some higher production and quality birds to small stakeholders or backyarders because these birds, the white and blue anyway, has the potential of laying 300 eggs a year or giving good feed and management, while the other mail order chicks might have not laid as pretty of eggs and maybe only done 60, 80, 100 eggs a year. So it's just more resource responsible to have a higher potential production. That way they get more eggs for all the feed they put in them. So I'm doing that with a lot of other breeds and making more um, packages and selling them to supply hatcheries around the country and and the meat birds are the biggest seller right now for me and I have some culinary lines and some that are based on genetic backgrounds that are unlike the other meat chickens and so I think they have some real advantages on robustness and non-problematic and better tasting meat. So um, you have you are a custodian of a few lines I understand. Would yes. you explain that concept please? Well a custodian is someone that takes care of something they should be looking after it for the, the best interest of that line and I think some of these hackle lines that I have I have bought them all uh, I feel responsible to carry them on, make sure they're in better shape when I turn them over to somebody else than they are when I got them. So I make sure they have adequate genetic diversity and they're properly managed from a genetic point of view so they're not running downhill and getting too inbred and whatnot. I've also produced some lines that don't exist anywhere else, like the spay hackle. Is, uh, I can get into that, but I also have been, people have sought me out and said, you know, one of my neighbors had some hackle chickens and 
he gave them to me and I'd like you to take him over because I really don't want to do it and it's kind of down your alley. And so I have a number of lines which I call my historic lines or uh, library stocks that I maintain. I turn a generation about every 14 months on them. That's about their generational time. And I keep a couple of hundred of them going every year just so somebody's doing it because they represent what Hackle was maybe in the 40s or the 30s or the 50s. And I keep them extant and they have color, color genetics in there that I want to preserve in a different way. So I just, I think, responsibly maintain them and keep them going. And um, they're also getting better every generation because I guess I can't help myself. I'm always selecting for the best ones within the group. So they're far better when, now than when I got them. But I haven't crossed things into them because if you cross them with something, you don't have that anymore. So it's important you keep them isolated or separate. So even though there are ones that you that you imp decide to improve, mm -hmm. the ones that you want to keep pure, you don't crossbreed with anything? Right, yes, because once you do it, you no longer have that. So you showed us some Dorkings back there. And yes. You said, I'm putting a little of this and that in there. Yeah, but I was keeping the Dorkings pure, too. <laughs> okay, so that's the difference. Yes, uh, yes. Is that if you have the purity of the original line, you can always cross them with something. That's right. But the second you adulterate them, you're toast. That's right. So um, I, I wanted to ask how, as they would say in business school, steeple factors impact your business. So we've got society, you know, technological advances, legal, environmental, political factors, things like that. Uh, you had a spot on your website that talked about how massively those things can impact your business. Can you describe some of those things, please? Uh, you're very right. I never thought when I got into launched into this business I'd be working uh, worrying about exchange rates for the dollar. But that has a huge effect because Whiting Farms, the feather uh, products there, we're at least two thirds to three quarters of all of our sales are outside the United States. And so the strength of the dollar or its weakness or you know the other currencies around really impact our sales. They'd buy more if they could afford it, but the dollar tends to be too strong these days and so that's hurt us, but we're still largely export. That's had a big effect. When I first got into the business, there was a problem in the trout population called whirling disease which is a spore that affected their spinal column and they'd swim in circle. That's why they call it a whirling disease. And people were saying, well, this is the end of fly fishing. But oddly enough, they worked out the release fish, found resistant ones, that they pretty well solved that. So they come and go. Global warming, on the other hand, is really much more real. And I'm not I'm adamantly against all the deniers of it. I think it's very real. And that's going to really shift where trout are because they have to have cold water. And so it's going to push it farther north and the water supply and droughts and things. I think that has more impact. The one thing that was really a shock in the not too recent past was uh, when the last recession, you know, when the subprime market real estate took a dive in 2008, was it? In nine, Lehman Brothers, you know, faded away and all these things. Uh, I'd always had the assumption in the in the hackle business, the other people, Henry Hoffman and Ted Hebert, always told me it was recession-proof. No matter what happens, people still want to tie their flies and fish. It's That's more important than any other thing else in their lives, apparently. Well, when that happened, it was very shocking in that when people were watching that implosion going and people thought it was the start of a world depression, our phone didn't ring. And it wasn't that people stopped fishing or stopped tying flies, it was rather the people we sell to, the specialty fly fishing shops or the big box chains like Cabela's or Orvist. They were so economically insecure, they were holding off buying something to put in the inventory because nobody knew what was going to happen. And uh, all of a sudden, we were, you know, normally when, we were, when that happened, the fall of 2008, I think it was, uh, we're really cranking up for our annual feather sales for fly fishing and it just wasn't happening. Fortunately, I was in you know, decent enough financial shape we could weather that, but it was a wake-up call. And I would, was working on a lot more of these uh, commercial lines at the same time, so I made the conscious decision to up them because dry fly hackle is a one horse parade, if you will, and if no one's coming to the parade, we might be in pretty bad shape. So I made the conscious decision to crank them up. Well, after the, the fashion feather thing came around, and that was an incredible shot in the arm in 2011 and 12, and then 
uh, so we got back on track pretty quickly. It was it was quite nice. And once things settled down, the store started buying our hackle again. And the ironic thing that I'm sitting on here in 2017 is the market for our feather bird continues to go up. And the uh, it's in the last couple of years, it's almost exploded the commercial demand for my birds, for the breeders and things like that. So we're rather squeezed on production capacity and I'm planning on putting up at least three sheds this year alone, you know, add to the 22 that we already have, just to keep up with demand. Another thing has happened though, is some of the, the my new project lines that I started in the 90s and took 10, 15 years to develop, finally caught on. And so what would have been a little R&D project or maybe 500 to 1,000 birds a year just to keep the project going and sell them out turned into five and 10,000 bird a year demands. And so when you have, I have about three or four of those projects that have come on, they count for you know 20 to 30,000 roosters a year, just them. So I'm a little bit strapped on production. We're maxed out in the whole system right now. There ain't a shed that isn't unfull. <laughs> And, and we're the, the turnovers are really tight, so I need some more production capacity right now. That's a good problem to have. I guess so. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com backyard green tv we want to thank tom whiting of whiting farms for having us out today in beautiful delta colorado if you'd like more information about tom whiting and whiting farms please visit www.whitingfarms.com You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. We'd also like to thank our producer, Michelle Council. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.